right, so on Monday, we finished up viruses. That didn't take very long because we were almost done with that. Um, and then we started on chapter 22 on prokaryotes. So most of what we talked about was just the intro stuff. Like, what are they? What um, cellular structure structures would you expect to see? Um, where do you find them? We talked about extremes of come on, extremes of um, condition that they can live in. We talked about oh early life, so that's important. The early atmosphere um, age of these groups, so 3.5 billion years first prokaryotes. Um, first cellular life, right? That's why that's important because these are the oldest actual cells, right? Remember, cells are the smallest unit that can function, uh, perform all the functions of living things. So we don't know where viruses came from. We don't know if viruses were here first or came later after the evolution cells, but first cellular life. So prokaryotes 3.5 billion years ago, that's a good number to know. Remember, I told you I'm not going to have you guys memorize like charts of numbers and values very often, but there are some that you need to know. Age of Earth, 4.5 billion or so, 4.5 to 4.6. Um, age of prokaryotes, that'd be another good one. And then we mentioned the appearance of cyanobacteria, um, which is significant because we're looking at the evolution of photosynthesis, right? And that's 2.7 billion years. So just some, you know, every billion years or so, something major happens in the history of life on Earth that we're talking about so far. So why is the evolution of photosynthesis significant, specifically uh, with the atmosphere? Yeah, so before, uh, before cyanobacteria evolved the ability to turn carbon into sugar using energy from the sun, we were making oxygen as a byproduct, there's no oxygen in the atmosphere, right? So most of the life, including us, that we think about um, as existing today is aerobic, meaning we're requires oxygen or uses oxygen for metabolism, cellular respiration. Um, and that wouldn't have happened without that development. So that's pretty significant. So make sure that you um, are aware of that significance that we have cyanobacteria to thank for that um, and probably the date, approximate date for that would be a good thing to commit to memory as we're sort of building on the story of biodiversity on the planet, right? Putting it all into a framework of, um, of time and events. All right, extremophiles we talked about. Just remember, you guys need to know uh, the conditions that each one of these types of extremophiles thrives in, but you don't, again, have to know these values. Okay? I'm not going to ask you the difference between something that lives at 80 C versus 70 C. Okay? I'm not going to throw you stupid stuff like that. But just know the, know the general conditions. Uh, we talked about biofilms, and I think we ended here on structures, typical structures that you might see in a prokaryotic cell. And then we talked about classification by shape. Right? So that's a, a, a decent intro into prokaryotes. Um, now we get to talk about the evolution of the groups, which is really where it starts to get pretty interesting, um, I think. Um, so yeah, a lot of the early stuff that we talked about is just kind of memorizing structure, right? Morphology, classification, things like that. So we'll get into the interesting stuff now. So remember how we talked about uh, both bacteria and archaea, two out of three domains, of life on the planet are considered prokaryotic, right? So they have all these things in common, single cell, no membrane bound organelles, no membrane bound nucleus, but they um, still are very different, different enough to be classified into two different domains, right? And remember we talked about the major differences between the two are uh, chemical composition of the cell wall. You don't have to know what that is. Okay, we're not gonna study the molecules, but that's one of the major differences. Um, and then there are other, differences that we'll talk about too and i'll show you sort of what i want you to take away what i want you to know um, versus what i want you to just sort of digest okay so we'll go through that um timelines indicate that bacteria diverged from a common ancestor between 2.5 and 3.2 billion years ago these are not dates that you guys need to memorize this is just for context um and then archaea appears to have diverged much earlier between 3.1 and 4.1 billion years ago okay so again you don't need to uh know this but what I want to start talking about is this relationship, all right? So here's the universal ancestor, or LUCA, last universal common ancestor. That's the acronym we use, L-U-C-A. This is the original life, right? We don't know what it was specifically. So it's nothing that exists today. So it wasn't a bacterium, 
Okay, it wasn't an archaea. So it wasn't something that we can define or taxonomically classify that's still around today, but something from which everything sprung. Okay, so what we're talking about here with these timelines is that deep, deep in deep time, somewhere between three and four billion years ago, the lineage that led to archaea split off from that last universal common ancestor. Okay? And this information is based on all types of different data and evidence. Okay, so this is our best guess as to when that divergence occurred. Um, and then bacteria basically just diverged later from that same common ancestor. Okay, so we're looking at two distinct branches on the tree of life with these two domains, and then later eukaryote branches off of archaea. Again, remember we sort of talked about this uh, last time when we looked at that tree. Eukaryote was thought to be most closely linked to archaea. And we'll talk about that more in the next chapter when we're talking about evolution of eukaryotes. Um, so we'll get to that. So just talking about relationships. Okay. So this is the fun stuff. We're going to compare the three domains. Um, these are not, again, things that you guys have to memorize, but I want you to get the big picture. And the idea here is looking at, in, in the box, considering relative complexity okay, of shared derived traits versus shared ancestral traits. So before we talk about that, let's talk about what that means. Um, what is an ancestral trait, you guys think? Yeah, it hasn't changed much over time. It's sort of like the original state of being. Okay, the older lineages had that. That would have been the first trait. Okay, so organisms or groups of organisms that have shared ancestral traits mean that they all have that trait and they all have a shared ancestor who they got that trait from. Okay, so contrast that with shared derived traits. What's something that's derived? You guys know that term? If you derive something, even if you're thinking in terms of like math, when you're deriving something. Any idea what that word means? It sort of means to like come to, right? To come to a conclusion or come to a solution, right? If you're thinking about derivations in math, right? So a derived trait is something that has happened later, that has sprung up along the, the lineage. It's new, okay? It's not ancestral. So when we're talking about shared derived traits, these are things that groups have in common later down the line, further down the tree more recently in time, okay? So that's what we're getting at here. When we're talking about relative complexity, that's what it sounds like, simple versus complex in terms of the traits, okay? So bear with me, we'll go through the list. Um, the first thing that we'll look at here um, is comparing bacteria and archaea um, in these three areas. So nuclear envelope, bacteria, and archaea are both missing though. We know that already. Right, that's that membrane-bound nucleus, and there are your membrane-bound organelles, absent in both groups, okay? Present in eukarya. So far, so good. That's all, that's not new information. We're just looking at it in a different format here. Um, what do you think is more complex, not having a nuclear membrane or having a nuclear membrane? Having it, right? So it's got to come from somewhere. It's derived. Right? It's, an, it's an evolved trait, it's a derived trait. So the assumption here based on complexity, as well as other evidence, is that these, that is evidence that these are older domains, the prokaryotes are older, and that the nuclear membrane and the membrane bound organelles is a derived trait that is present only in eukaryotes. Okay, so that's an example of looking at relative complexity. Um, the chromosomes are also uh, something to look at when we're comparing bacteria and archaea. They have a single circular chromosome. That means they have one piece of DNA that's in a ring, right? It's attached to itself in its circle, okay? What do eukaryotic chromosomes look like? Do you guys remember from previous biology courses? How many do we have usually? Hmm? Humans have 46, right? 23 pairs. So more than one. So that's unique. The single, the singleness of the chromosome in prokaryotes is unique. We have more than one, and they're linear, right? They're not circular. Now, when you think about mitosis, they condense, right? So those long strings of chromatin in the nucleus during mitosis condense during prophase, right? So that they can be packaged up tightly in the little sort of format that we think of when we think of um, chromosomes. 
this sort of sister cook and say it appears. You guys remember that, right? Then when they duplicate, they look like this. Yeah? You guys with me? You guys need to get some D. John Cook knows, yeah. Okay. So normally, so this is a condensed pair of chromosomes, right? But normally in the nucleus, they're like this, right? Like this protein threads. But they're linear, they're not connected, they're not in loops. So that's the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Bacteria and archaea, or prokaryotes, share that single circular chromosome arrangement. That circular chromosome is absent in eukaryotes. You would consider that a derived trait that's present only in eukaryotes. You guys with me so far on this? All right, stop me if I'm getting confusing. Then when you look at the similarities between archaea and eukarya, you start to see some other similarities between those two groups and differences with bacteria. Okay, so this is just showing other lines of evidence and other characteristics that are that these domains share or not. So we're showing that transition. All right, if we look at um, RNA polymerase, you guys know what RNA polymerase is? It ends in ASE. What does that mean? You guys know that? It means it's an enzyme, right? Enzymes almost always end with ACE, helicase, polymerase, dehydrogenase, right? Just an example. They're almost always going to be enzymes. Um, so RNA polymerase is just one of the enzymes that helps build RNA molecules and cells, okay? Uh, bacteria have one version of RNA polymerase that they use, and um, both archaea and eukarya have multiple types of RNA polymerase. They do different things. So this is a good example of an evolutionary characteristic, a derived trait that is more complex than you see in the ancestral pair, right? So the idea here is that originally, the universal common ancestor of all of these life forms would have had one form of RNA polymerase, yes? That bacteria retain that ancestral trait, but archaea and eukarya both share the derived trait of multiple types of RNA polymerase, which indicates relative complexity of that shared derived trait. You guys follow? Still on the bus with me? What I'm talking about here? Okay. Um, same thing with introns. These are those non-coding regions, right, that are excised out when you um, translate and messenger RNA. Very, very rare in bacteria, present sometimes in archaea and all the time in eukaryotes. So again, just an example of shared uh, derived traits that are complex. And the same thing with histones. Uh, you guys remember what histones are? Those little sort of beads on the string of chromatin that those uh, chromosomes wind up around when they're condensing into that chromosome form in one place. Yes, histones? Okay. Um, we have them, archaea do too, in some species, but you never see them in bacteria. So you guys don't have to memorize this, okay? Again, let me, let me say it louder so, you, so that you're not spending too much time getting bogged down in this. This is more... Uh, complex and more detailed than what I need you guys to know in 1108. Okay, but what I want you to sort of think about is what's in this box, right? So there are lots of ways that we can look at these organisms and classify them using traits and say, hey, these must have been the ancestral condition, these simpler traits, and then these derived traits that are relatively more complex sort of illustrate or provide strength to the hypothesis that looks like this. Right, the domain eukarya and domain archaea closely related, sharing those derived traits that are absent in bacteria, which tend to stay a little bit simpler and retain more of those ancestral traits. I'm gonna stop for a second, let it sink in. You guys okay? All right, moving on. Questions about this? Everything? All right. Let's talk about cell walls again. So we talked about this a little bit um, last time. Prokaryotic cell walls, uh, cells, sorry, contain high concentrations of dissolved solutes, creating high osmotic pressure within the cell. So let's think about what that means. You are a prokaryote, so you do not have membrane-bound organelles, right? So you don't have things like peroxisomes and lysosomes and all these compartmentalized membranous organelles in which chemical reactions are taking place, right? So where are those chemical reactions taking place? All of your dissolved solutes. Cytoplasm. right? So you've got a really high concentration of stuff in the cytoplasm. And water follows solutes, right? We were talking about osmosis last time. So the idea here is that within 
normal conditions, um, water is going to be pulled in towards that high osmotic pressure. Right? There's a lot of solute inside, it's sucking water in, that's pulling, that's osmotic pressure, right? So you've got high pressure within the cell. All bacteria have cell walls to some extent that provide that structural integrity to prevent lysis. We talked about that, right? Bursting. You pull in too much water, there's too much water in your environment that's drawn inside the cell because of all that dissolved solute, then your cell membrane is fluid, right? It's phospholipid. It can easily lyse like an animal cell. But that doesn't happen because you've got cell walls. It also protects you in the opposite direction. We're talking about halophilic bacteria that are uh, well adapted to extremes of salinity, high salt concentrations, so they also don't lose too much water. But that's what that cell wall is there for. Okay, we'll talk about that again when we talk about plants, because they have them too. Same reason um, for osmotic pressure regulation, okay, protection from changes in os osmotic pressure. When we're looking at different types of bacteria, you can classify them by um, the chemical composition of that cell wall. So we said that it was made of peptidoglycan. That was on slide several uh, frames back. So that's what we're talking about here. And we're specifically talking about the difference between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. This is just another way of classifying uh, prokaryotes, okay? Sort of like classifying by shape. Um, this is just another, again, there are lots of ways to classify bacteria, and we're not gonna get into all of them. If you need that, you'll take microbiology, okay? Medical micro or intro to micro or whatever you do later. But we're just sort of dipping our toe in the water of classifying these organisms. But we're talking about here is one way of doing that. If you guys, anybody work in medicine or have any uh, pharmacy or nursing or any kind of experience where you've heard of gram positive or gram negative bacteria before? Okay. Well, if you're heading in that direction, you will eventually hear about this. Um, so it is important to know whether a bacteria that is causing disease in an organism is gram positive or gram negative because they respond differently to antibiotics because of the structure of their cell wall and cell membrane. Okay, so this is um, getting into a, a new, another technique that we'll talk about in the next slide called the gram stain. You guys have heard of the gram stain? Some of you are nodding, that's a, maybe a familiar term. Um, so what's happening with gram staining is you're determining the thickness of the peptidoglycan layer. So in this image, which is fairly simplified schematic of the cell wall um, and the outer sort of layers of both these types of bacteria, the blue squares represent layers or thickness of peptidoglycan, okay, that compound that makes up the cell wall. In a gram-positive bacterium, it's really thick versus really thin and gram-negative, okay? Gram-negative bacteria have other uh, layers, okay? Those other layers, even though their cell wall, that peptidoglycan layer is really thin, these other layers are really tough and antibiotic resistant. So if you get an infection with a gram-negative bacterium, uh, it can be much more difficult to treat it. It doesn't respond in the same way to typical antibiotics like penicillin and things like that. Um, and it all has to do with that basically comes down to that peptidoglycan layer, okay, which makes it gram positive or gram negative. Um, we're not going to get into too much detail about the difference between the two other than it's based on that cell wall. And then here's how gram staining works. Okay, so this is kind of cool. You may get to do this at some point in, um, in a lab, especially if you take mine, though. Um, so the difference between gram positive and gram negative is what color they turn when you stain them. So step one is you, you well, first of all, you make a, a slime, right? You take a sample of the bacteria, you put it on a, on a microscope spot and you heat fit, fit so it's stuck okay, to the slime. And then you stain it with a stain called crystal violet, which is purple. And purple sticks to that peptidoglycan, right? So you're looking at the cell wall here, the purple stuff, the crystal violet is clinging to this layer. So far, so good. Okay. Then you um, do a mordant step. So you use iodine to fix that stain. So everything that's purple stays purple. At least a little bit better, sort of like blue. Um, the next step you do is a decolorization stain where you take an alcohol and you rinse it. Okay. So in a gram positive cell wall that's thick with peptidoglycan, it holds on to that purple stain and stays purple. But gram negative has such a small layer of peptidoglycan that the crystal violet washes out. So the alcohol step, so they end up colorless. So far, so good. The last step is a counter stain, which is something called saffronin, which is red. Um, and it's sort of pinkish red. So what happens is if the purple is still there in a gram positive bacteria, 
um, the red doesn't really show up. But if it has washed out because it's gram negative, then the pink stain, the counter stain, dips. So in the end, gram positive bacteria look purple and gram negative look pink. It really comes down to what color it is. This is kind of fun to do in the lab, and it's an interesting way um, of distinguish distinguishing gram negative from gram positive, and it's significant clinically. We still use it in a lot of situations to figure out what kind of bacteria you're dealing with in certain types of uh, um, infections. Okay, so I may ask you guys to identify whether something is gram negative or gram positive based on what it looks like. Here's a good way to remember positive, purple, peptidoglycan. Okay, thick peptidoglycan holds on to the purple, that makes it gram positive. So PP is the positive purple peptidoglycan. Gram negative, None of those. Well, the pepid of light hand, but just a little bit. And so maybe that helps. So that's just the type of test, just the diagnostic to classify it as a gram positive or gram negative, which again can affect the way you uh, treat a, a, a particular infection. Okay, so that's all that's going on there. All right, moving on. Let's talk about HGT. You guys remember what HGT stands for? Horizontal. Gene transfer. There you go. Good. Um, so remember, we said that this has to do with reproduction, but prokaryotes do not use sexual reproduction. Okay? They reproduce asexually through binary fission. So essentially, that single circular chromosome is duplicated, and then the cell splits in half. And one duplicate goes in one cell, and one goes in the other cell. What does that mean for genetic diversity from one generation to the next? Mother cells, daughter cells. If you're just replicating your one chromosome, splitting in half, with no sexual reproduction, what should those offspring cells look like genetically? They should be identical to the parent cell, right? Um, but bacteria and archaea, prokaryotes in general, have some really interesting ways of overcoming that sort of uh, genetic, I don't want to call it a defect, but like disadvantage, right? Because why is genetic variability an advantage. What does variability allow you to do as a population? Evolve, adapt, right? So if all the bacteria that ever came from a single parent cell, lineage after lineage, generation upon generation, were genetically identical, guess what would never be a problem? Antibiotic resistance, right? Because the environment changes, you can change one thing and everybody's wiped out because they're all genetically the same. But that's not the case. So these guys have a really some really cool ways of getting around that fact that they are asexually reproducing, but they still get genetic diversity. And there are three mechanisms through which prokaryotes can share DNA and swap. Okay, so I want you guys to know the difference between these three. So it's vocabulary to an extent, um, but there are mechanisms behind it. So transformation. This is actually pretty cool. So DNA from from bacteria, other bacteria, can be picked up. From the environment. So when a bacteria dies, or an archaea, a prokaryote dies, um, and that cell wall or cell membrane bursts, what happens to the stuff inside the cell? What do you think? Well, if a balloon pops, what happens to the water inside of it? So well, right? So that's exactly what happens when you have cells die. Okay, so the interior seals out, including a DNA. Now, do bacteria or archaea, prokaryotes, live in isolation? Not usually, right? Usually they're living in large quantities, large populations, colonial, cooperative, biofilms, and otherwise. So bacteria that are still alive can actually take up bits and pieces of DNA from the bacteria that have died and spilled their content. So that is transformation. We call it transformation because one bacteria can take on the characteristics of another by picking up its DNA. So, for example, this was first discovered in a couple of different lineages of bacteria that cause uh, different strains of influenza. So there's one bacterium that doesn't cause it, and there's another type that does, different species. And when they were cultured together, it could kill the influenza causing one, but then the, the benefit, not, so let's say, uh, non pathogenic species became pathogenic and started causing that influenza. And everyone was like, what? What's happening? It looks like they have been transformed from non-infectious bacteria to infectious bacteria. That's exactly what was happening. They weren't sure exactly how, but that's how the investigation sort of opened, was looking at those types of, of um, 
phenomena. But that's what transformation is. One species picks up DNA from the atmosphere, from the environment, and incorporates it into their own genome and starts using those genes. Weird, right? But that's how it works. Um, the second mechanism I want you guys to know is transduction. This one is important for a couple of different reasons. So uh, in transduction, you get the same thing happening, but it's actually a transfer using a, a vector, and that vector is a virus. Okay, remember we talked about bacteriophages? Those are viruses that specifically infect bacteria. So they can, this little image here is sort of showing, land on the surface of one bacteria, infect them, and in the meantime, pick up DNA. When they land on another, they can deliver it. Okay, so it's spreading DNA from one living bacteria to another living bacteria by way of a virus vector. That's been beneficial to research for us because we can use the idea that viral vectors, bacteriophages, can do this. We can introduce a gene of interest or something we want to put into another population of bacteria into a viral vector and use that vector to insert a gene into another population of bacteria. And so we're talking about genetic modification, right? We're talking about modification for being able to produce compounds we want. We're talking about modifications for things like being able to digest certain compounds like oil. And we'll look at bioremediation here in a little while. But we, um, not only does this happen naturally, and that's called transduction, one moves from one place to another by a page, but we also manipulate this in the lab. So biotechnology, okay? significant advances there. The last way is conjugation. And we talked about this a little bit when we were looking at the possibility of finding a pilus. You guys remember back in, let's go back a little ways here, this picture. When we were looking at sort of the generalized structure and I told you these were PLI or pilus, the portals were pilus. Um, it's drawn in a little bit more simple manner here. But that's what you're looking at here. Two bacterial cells next to each other connected to each other by this pilot. It's just a, just a cytoplasmic cell membrane extension. They connect up and they can share DNA. Kind of like sexual reproduction, but not. Okay, not, my, not meiosis or anything like that, but that's conjugation. Okay? Information from the environment, transduction by way of a phage, conjugation using the pilot. Good? All of these different ways are ways that you can get genetic variability into populations of bacteria without sexual reproduction. Okay, that's how we see so much change um, in these lineages. And it's not mutation, it's different. It's horizontal gene transfer, because it's species to species in many cases. You guys clear with the distinction the peanuts and things? Okay. It's not as exciting as peanuts, I thought it might be. Come on. All right, well, how about metabolism? Let's see if you guys get wrong, wrong what's about metabolism. This is interesting stuff. This is also stuff that you probably know somewhat, okay? So we'll review. We'll, I'll test, test your knowledge from previous classes. Um, again, prokaryotic metabolism is incredibly diverse. When we talk about each group of organisms going forward, we will talk about their metabolism. Are they phototrophs? Are they heterotrophs? Right? How do they do this? Do they make their own food? Do they have to eat stuff? What kind of energy do they use? But with bacteria and archaea, they do everything. So every combination of energy and carbon source that you can think of exists in the prokaryotic domains. Okay, so there are examples of all of them. We're going to look at this a little bit going forward. So everything that is alive has to metabolize, right? Meaning you have to get energy from somewhere and you have to get nutrients from somewhere. Um, so we're going to look at energy source and carbon source, okay? Everything also needs some additional macro and micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, things like that that you get from the environment, but we're going to look at energy and carbon, okay? So if you use light to power your metabolic reaction, you are a phototroph, okay? You guys remember the terms autotroph, heterotroph? Have you heard those before? Yeah. Because you guys studied photosynthesis and cellular respiration in the first half of this class, bio one, right? So a phototroph is an organism that uses light energy to power the metabolic reactions. So what do you think a chemotroph is? Don't even look over here yet. We're not looking at carbon sources. We're just talking about energy. What if you use chemical energy? 
That makes you a chemotrope, right? Are you a phototrope or are you a chemotrope? Chemotrope. Where did your energy come from? Food, right? Chemical bonds in the macromolecules in the food that you eat. You break them, you harness that energy, you tack on a phosphate to ADP, you make ATP, and boom, you're off and running, right? Can you go stand in the parking lot and like bask and get stronger from the sun? <laughs> you cannot, right? So you're a chemotrope. Okay. What about carbon sources? If you were an autotrope, who's making your food for you? Cells. Cell, right? That auto means cell. Um, so usually you're talking about carbon dioxide with an autotrope. Okay, they're taking carbon from the atmosphere, either the water or the air. They're using that carbon dioxide for carbon skeletons. Okay, they're using those carbons, they're rearranging them, they're building the other carbon-based molecules of life, like sugar and amino acids, lipids, right? Um, and heterotrophs are using something else. They still need carbon skeletons. We still have to do the same process. We still have to build protein. We still have to make cell membranes and we still have to build muscle and things like that, right? But we use carbon skeletons that we obtain from other organic sources besides inorganic carbon dioxide. So that's the difference between the autotroph and the heterotroph. So you guys comfortable with that? Your energy source makes you a phototroph or chemotroph, and your carbon source makes you an autotroph or heterotroph. Then the next step is to look at examples when you combine them all together. Okay? So here are your four major groups. And this is so I can tell this is like you guys are jazzed about this. Okay. Photo autotroph, photo heterotroph. Where are we going? With this chemo autotroph and chemo heterotroph. Okay, so you're just combining the two uh, where your energy and where your carbon comes from. So a photo autotroph, that one's easy. Where does the energy come from? Light. What about carbon? Yeah, atmospheric carbon dioxide. Typical photosynthesizer of light cyanobacteria is an example of a photo autotroph. A plant, a photosynthetic plant is a photo autotroph. Uh, algae. Photosynthetic protein, photo autotroph. Okay? Light, cell, so think carbon dioxide, okay, with autotroph. A photoheterotroph, these are weirdos. Okay, this is not the typical thing that you think about. These may not be organisms that you've ever heard of before. They're still using light energy, right? Because it's a phototroph, but it's also a heterotroph. So what the heck does that mean? It's technically feeding on some other substrate. It's not using carbon dioxide typically because the carbon dioxide is scarce or unavailable. So they're using other organic substances, things like sugar or fats or amino acids that are in their environment available. So they're, they're just using those carbon skeletons just like they would from carbon dioxide, and they don't use carbon dioxide. So they're getting their carbon from somewhere else, but they're still using light as their energy source. Um, purple non-sulfur bacteria is the best group that you can use as an, as an example of this. Um, that's just it. I can't really ask you too much about, about purple non-sulfur bacteria, um, but they're kind of interesting because of their metabolism. Um, chemo autotroph. Let's come back to that. Let's look at chemo heterotroph. This one's easy. Why is that one easy? Should be familiar because that's you, right? Use the chemical energy from your food to power metabolism, and you're using carbon from your food to make those macromolecules. Chemo heterotroph. So there are bacteria and archaea that fit into this group as well. You've got things that are decomposers. What does a decomposer do? That breaks other stuff down, right? Things that are dead uh, or old and, and rotting, that's because decomposers are eating it, essentially. Um, gut microbes. We talked about your microbiota. Right, your microbiome, those flora that live in your intestines, they are chemo heterotrophs. They're eating your food just like you are eating your food. Okay, um, pathogenic bacteria like flesh eating bacteria, they are chemo heterotrophs. Right, they're eating things like your tissue. Yeah, all right, so that one should be familiar. So, photoautotroph, think photosynthesis, chemo heterotroph, just eating, that's us. The other two are the weirdos. So back to chemo autotroph. This is autotroph, so where's it getting its carbon? Where are those carbon skeletons coming from to an autotroph? 
What about okay? What about back up here with photosynthesis? Where is the carbon coming from? Hmm? Yes, water, air, right? Carbon dioxide. So people autotrophs are still using carbon dioxide, but they can't use light. Maybe there's no light available. Okay, so for a really good example of this, uh, think about hydrothermal vent communities. You guys know where hydrothermal vents are located? Bottom of the ocean. How much light reaches the bottom of the ocean? None. It's pitch black down there. So, um, prokaryotes that live down by those hydrothermal vents can use carbon dioxide from the water because that's available there. Um, but the energy that they're using is not light energy, it's chemical energy, usually from hydrogen sulfide that's coming out of those hydrothermal vents. So they're using some other kind of chemical bond besides they can't use light to power those, that, um, me those metabolic processes, so they're using chemical energy. Good? So just know the difference. You'll we'll see questions about that, okay? And it's kind of interesting to think about the fact that there's so much diversity in these groups, in these two domains. Because when we get to talking about things like fungi or animals or plants, they're pretty specific in how they do things. And the bacteria and archaea, a whole lot of diversity there. Cool. Full flow chart, if you like this kind of visualization. This is exactly the same information that's on this slide, only in flow chart form. So if that's how your brain works, that's for you. Okay? Nothing new there. Let's talk about pathogens. All right. If you weren't excited about metabolism, you weren't excited about horizontal gene transfer, maybe you can get into pathogenicity. What is a pathogen? An organism that can do what? Yeah, causes disease in other organisms. So that's right there for you. An organism that has the ability to cause disease in another organism. Uh, bacterial pathogens have caused and continue to cause disease in humans and other organisms. We know that, right? That's just given. We're aware of that. Bacteria can make you sick. Here's this little note. I told you it would be in here eventually. There are no known pathogenic archaea. So to date, there are no archaea that have been identified in pathogenicity in any organism. Okay? However, always, always in any science, more research in this area is needed. So there are some studies that show the presence of archaeal species in certain types of infections. Um, gum disease, for one, okay? But there's no correlation yet. Of there's no causation. Okay, so there's correlation, they're present, but actually are they causing the infection or not? That remains to be determined. So as of this point, the answer is no. So we don't go hunting for archaea when we're looking for the source of infection. It's almost always bacteria, at least up to now, okay? Always more to learn, but for now, that's that's okay to know. Okay, no pathogenic archaea currently identified. Um, these terms, epidemic, pandemic, endemic, and epidemiology, might be familiar to you, maybe more so now than they would have been a year or two ago, right? Um, so these are just terms that describe patterns of infection in public health. Okay. So if you have an epidemic, that's a disease that's happening in a lot of people in a single population at the same time, okay? A pandemic, what does that mean? You guys have heard that term tossed around a lot, right? Lately. What is the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic? What do you think? Global, yep. Pandemic means it's multiple continents, right? It is not in a single population anymore. So when they first started identifying SARS-CoV-2 in China, that was maybe an epidemic, but very, very quickly it became a pandemic. With humans in the 21st century, that's kind of like gonna happen, right? If there's an epidemic outbreak of some disease somewhere, why did it so easily become a pandemic? Wow, we don't sit still. Right? There's no way to close it all down. We can try, but we move around too much. So pandemic versus epidemic, basically it's the same thing. Just pandemic means globally. Um, endemic means sort of the same thing as native. You can think of it as sort of a synonym. An endemic disease is one that is always present in a population, but usually at low levels. So something that's not eradicated or completely gone from the population, but doesn't cause epidemic <clears throat> infections. Okay, that's endemic. 
And then epidemiology is just the study of disease, the study of epidemics, occurrence, distribution, determinants of health and disease in a population. Epidemiology, lots and lots of interest lately in that field. Lots of people inspired by Dr. Fauci. You guys know who Dr. Fauci is? Surgeon General? He's a NIH. He's in the National Institute of Health. So he's like the old guy with white hair and glasses that's on TV, he's on TV so much that he's always talking about growing heads. Anyway, he's an epidemiologist, public health professional. Um, yeah, I was reading something the other, day, the other day that was saying that programs, public health masters, PhD in epidemiology, those programs have seen a huge increase in applicants recently. Kind of interesting to think about how people want to study stuff like coronavirus. Anyway, group is this this little blurb in the book talking about career connections to epidemiology. So check it out if you're interested. All right, let's talk about history. Who wants to talk about this? That's always kind of fun. Little side side path in biology. Um, bacteria have been causing problems for as long as people have been around. Um, some really interesting examples. The plague of Athens. You guys ever heard of the plague of Athens? You're nodding. So the reason that this was significant is because this happened during the Peloponnesian War. And Athens was a major uh, power, and they were fighting with Sparta, I think, among others. Um, they got this disease, and they really still aren't sure what it is. There's some evidence that it might have been a salmonella um, variant that made people sick. So many people got so sick that they it was almost as if law didn't make sense anymore. It was kind of like, we're going to die anyway, so what's the point? And everyone kind of went nuts. And there was there was so much like confusion and disarray and lawlessness that it actually led to the crumble of the strength of the Athenian army and ultimately their defeat in the Peloponnesian War. So the cool thing, and I don't know if it's cool or not, but it's interesting because this is a tiny little prokaryotic pathogen that changes the course of history, right? Or a major power in the Greek Empire. Um, same thing here. The plague of Justinian, this happened during, um, this is in Rome, this is the, during the Roman Empire ages. Um, and then the same disease emerges later in the 1300s that we now refer to as the Black Death or the Black Plague. So we've identified that uh, bacterium, that's Yersinia pestis, that causes the bubonic plague, but it's still around, endemic in population. Now you can treat it because now we know what it is. We have antibiotics. Did we have antibiotics in the 1300s? No, that's a new thing, right? Like 1930s, 1940s with penicillin. So um, these two are significant because this is the first time you see the plague, what's called the plague. And it's resurged multiple times throughout history. So the Black Plague was like the second time. There's a third one, I can't remember, it's later in history. But the point is, that these are significant historical events, not just diseases. So I'm talking on the order of killing like half of the population of certain countries. Okay, major, major uh, epidemics and pandemics. There's also plenty of stories about colonialism, where you take and you, you're moving in on a new area to try to see like what resources have you got to do in here? Do we kick the natives out? But when you come into a place and bring your germs with you, you introduce accidental biological warfare. What's biological warfare? You guys heard of that? Yeah, sure, right? What does that mean? If you can win a war against your enemy because of biological agents, right? So purposeful biological warfare is terrifying to think about, but accidental biological warfare happens too. Um, a good example of that that's not a bacteria, but rather a virus is smallpox in the Native Americans. Right? When people, when Europeans came and brought it over, and the American population had never experienced it before, completely naive immune systems killed lots of people. So that's what that's talking about here. The point is that bacterial infections over the course of human history have had major impacts in population size, in political trajectory. Right? It's all kind of uh, tied in with biology and politics and world geography and all that stuff. All right, so development of antibiotics and better sanitation practices have lessened the impact of bacterial infections over time. How so? What does that mean? So development of antibiotics, that's kind of a duh, that's a given, right? When we developed them, bacterial infections became less lethal. 
it wasn't a death sentence to get uh, a skin infection anymore, right? Because it used to be a possibility that you'd go work out in your garden and scratch your hand and get some bacteria in it and it would fester and then you would go, it would get in your bloodstream and you'd go septic and die. There's nothing anyone could do for you because you didn't have antibiotics until the accidental discovery of penicillin in the 1930s. It's an interesting story. If you ever Google it. Um, anyway, so that's a big one. But even just better sanitation practices, what does that mean? Say a little loud for me. Washing your hands, not emptying your chamber pot into the street. Just saying, right? You guys remember that it used to be a thing. Like in cities, if it, there wasn't plumbing, you just had like a pot in your house. And then you did your business, and then you're done, you just like toss it out the window. And then it was like in the gutters. I'm not making this stuff up, you guys. Um, so we don't do that anymore in developed countries, right? So just better sanitation. We know, thanks to people like Louis Pasteur, who said, hey, these are microbes and they cause disease. We now know how to sort of better behave, keep things cleaner, sanitize things, wash your hands, boil your water before you drink it. Don't throw your chamber pot out the window. Yeah. Um, so that's made a big difference in the impact of bacterial infections in human populations. Um, but it's still a significant contributor to mortality rates. What is mortality? Death, yeah. So it still causes death in developing countries. And the other challenge is antibiotic resistance. So you guys have heard of that. We've talked about it in here. We watched the video about the evolution of antibiotic resistance from, um, I think it was the Harvard study. But that's a little bit freaky, right? So how does that happen and what can we do to prevent this? We'll talk about that a little bit. We'll get there. I want to show you guys one quick slide. I mean, I'm not going to preserve here in half an hour. Um, emerging and re-emerging diseases. This is, uh, we've talked about zoonoses, but this is really the only term on here that I want you guys to know. We've already uh, visited that with viruses. So those are diseases that come from animals. Um, emerging diseases are new diseases defined by the World Health Organization as those that appear for the first time somewhere, okay, um, and continue to become a problem. And then re-emerging diseases are ones that you think you have under control but sort of make comebacks. And when they do, frequently it's hand in hand with antibiotic resistance because they're tougher to kill. Um, one of the, a good example of that is um, tuberculosis. It's on the map here, there, there, there are multiple places where TB is popping up and it's resistant to multiple types of antibiotics that we used to use to keep it under control. Right, so these are re-emerging diseases. Um, so just kind of be aware that that's a thing. I think you heard shattering on that slide. Um, in this section in your textbook, you can read about it if you're interested. All right, let's talk about antibiotic resistance. This is really important. This is important to understand, not only as a biology student, but as a human being, okay? Because there are things that you can do that directly contribute to or prevent this from happening, okay? So how does it develop? We watched that video, you guys remember. Right? It's selective pressure. If you have a population of bacteria and they're susceptible to antibiotics, um, they don't reproduce. Right? So you interrupt their pathway of building a new cell wall, or you keep them from being able to use their enzymes to make new DNA or something. You somehow inhibit their reproduction. Right? So antibiotics are used to, to stop those. But it's pretty easy, as we saw in that video, which is linked here again if you want to go back and watch it. You can find it there too. Um, pretty easy for bacteria to develop mutations that allow them to get around those metabolic pathways if you're interrupted with antibiotics. Same thing as we talked about with antiviral drugs, right? Viruses mutate quickly, bacteria mutate quickly, right? Just random mutations, but it just might happen that that mutation allows them to, to skirt around whatever metabolic pathway you are targeting. So let's use cell wall of synthesis as an example. Okay, so let's say the antibiotic uh, of interest interferes with the bacteria's ability to build a cell wall. So when it's trying to reproduce, it can't make cell walls. Okay, that's going to be problematic, right? Because those are important for osmotic pressure changes. So let's just say that bacteria down the line can't make effectively a cell wall because they've been super fed to antibiotics. But then you get mutants who can uh, build their cell wall using a little slight different compound in their pathway to building cell walls. You guys get it? How it works? So it doesn't take much. Um, 
So this happens in basically selection, right? Natural selection for resistant forms of bacteria results from a couple of different things. Overuse and misuse of antibiotics, those are the biggest ones that you can do something about in your own daily life, okay? The other cause here is excessive antibiotic use in livestock, which is a bigger problem than you can solve alone, but it's helpful to be aware of it. Um, so we'll talk about all three of those. So we're talking about overuse of antibiotics. We're talking about taking a course of antibiotics when you do not need it, okay? If you have a cold, that is caused by a virus, and you go to the doctor, and you say, I feel terrible, I need medicine, and they say, okay, we'll give you a ZPAC, and we'll give you a little course of antibiotics. Is that antibiotic gonna do anything to treat that viral infection? Absolutely not, right? Because antibiotics are specific to bacterial cells. Are viruses even so? No, right? They're definitely not bacteria. They're, uh, Certain, we've already said there are no drugs that cure viruses, right? So it's pointless to take an antibiotic. But unfortunately, it's been kind of common practice. It's getting less so now for physicians to do that. But it used to be like, what's the harm in just giving, okay, this lady's freaking out because her kid has a runny nose. Let's just give her an antibiotic to go home and feel better or to do something. What's the harm? Well, now we know that the harm is you are breeding antibiotic resistant bacteria. Because we also now understand that we have these complicated microbiomes, right? So you have bacteria that live in and on all of your body surfaces that are at least just hanging out, right? At best, helping you in some way. So we're going to talk about some benefits of our microbiome a little bit later in this chapter, um, but they're present. So when you take an antibiotic and you don't need one, you are effectively inhibiting the growth and development, reproduction of certain bacteria, but you're only inhibiting the ones that are that are susceptible or can be killed by that particular antibiotic. You guys with me? So if you have a population here of bacteria, mainly susceptible to an antibiotic here in yellow, but you've got these two mutants and they're resistant to your z pack you take the z pack even though you don't need it, it's not helping you get better, uh, you basically kill off most of the resistant population, but who is left? The mutants, right? And then the mutants are the ones that reproduce. And then everybody beyond that point is carrying the mutation for resistance to that particular antibiotic. Your runny nose isn't any better, but you have just bred a new population of stronger bugs, yes? Okay. So that's overuse, taking one when you don't need one. What about misuse? This is what we talk about um, finishing your course. So let's say you do need an antibiotic. Let's say you go to the doctor, you've got strep throat. Okay, you need to take a 10 day course of penicillin to knock it out, okay? So let me actually draw some stuff here. Let me get it to where that you can see. Okay. Anybody ever had strep throat? Taking an antibiotic course. Yeah. How many days? So let's say your doctor prescribed you a 10 day course. How many days do you take that antibiotic before you start feeling a little bit better? Hmm? Sorry, but I think I lost you. Maybe a week, maybe even a couple of days, right? So for the first day or two, when you go to the doctor finally, you're like, I know I'm going to die. This stuff is the worst, especially when you're a grown up. When you're a kid, you're like, kind of sick. When you get it as a grown up, it sucks, right? So feel terrible. So you're gonna die. Go to the doctor. Here's a here's a graph. Let's do uh, number of bacterial cells and days. Okay, so here's day zero. That's when you go to the doctor. Can you guys see this? Okay. Let me stand on the other side. Let me get it on. The other side. Day zero, you go to the doctor, your bacterial load is high, and okay? you're up here. You feel like crap. You got thousands, hundreds of thousands of bacteria roaming around in your throat and otherwise making you feel terrible. So you take your antibiotic. They want you to take it 10 days. Here's your 10 day mark, okay? So hypothetically, you should take it all 10 days, as they said to you, yes? 
So day one, day two, you're still taking your antibiotic. Day three, here's what's happening to your load. Decreasing, right? The back, number of bacteria that are present that are causing you trouble is decreasing. Day five comes around, your load's pretty low. In the meantime, your immune system is also fighting, right? So you feel so good at day five that you forget to take your antibiotic. Because it's easy to remember when you feel horrible that you're still getting your medicine, right? But now it's been my day. Oh, oh, also the doctor told you after two or three days, you're not contagious anymore. So you can go back to work and go back to school. So you're on about your life, right? Because you feel fine. So you forget to take your antibiotic and you end up with five days worth of pills just stuck in your medicine cabinet and you're fine. Because your first five days of antibiotic treatment have gotten your bacterial load down low enough where your immune system can basically take care of the rest and you move on with your life, right? But there's this, this population of bacteria that still exists, right? And it may not be enough to make you sick. Your immune system is probably taking care of that part for you. But after this point, you can still be spreading those bacteria into the world. When you go back to school or you go back to work, right? But these bacteria, who are these? These are the ones that did not die here, okay? So these are the ones that are least susceptible to the penicillin that your doctor prescribed for you back here on day zero. Does that make sense? So this does not mean that you will get sick again, that your load will go back up. It's possible, but usually not, right? And most of us, our immune system strong enough to keep that from happening. But now these dudes in exist. You have bred them. <laughs> Right? Now, in practice, in theory of practice, if you keep taking your antibiotic, by day 10, you're way down here. Right? Your load, your number of cells, you've killed everybody or close to everybody. Most of them. That's misuse of antibiotics. Stopping your course too early. Or another thing that happens a lot is that you do stop your course early and you have that five day supply in your medicine cabinet. So then like your brother gets sick and he's like, oh God, I feel just like you. And you're like, yeah, I was probably struck because I had last week and we shared a sandwich, right? So then your brother takes that five day course that you had laying around and he starts to feel better too. But what has he done? Exactly the same thing, right? So now you've done it twice. So finish your antibiotics and don't share, right? Because you don't have a full course. So you're doing the same thing. That's misuse. Does that make sense? Okay. I like to go on and on about that. I think that's interesting. It's applicable because we've all been sick, we've all taken antibiotics at some time or another. So those are the things that you should know about taking antibiotics in your own life or if you're going into medical practice for your patients, right? Good information to have. Um, the antibiotics in livestock thing is a little bit bigger of a problem that, like I said, you guys can't solve on your own. Um, this happens mostly in factory farming. So you guys know what factory farms mean, like what's happening on a factory farm. Is it like your neighbor's farm and they have like five cows and two pigs and a couple of chickens and they like make their own food? No, it's like Tyson, right? So there's five billion chickens in a coop together or a whole bunch of pigs in one place, right? Cows, whatever. Fast turnover, lots of animals packed together tightly, factory farming, yes? Um, they consistently treat those animals with antibiotics prophylactically. You guys know the term prophylaxis? It means prevention. So they give these pigs uh, antibiotics just so they don't get sick, okay? But that is in itself breeding these superbugs, right? Because of, it's overuse of antibiotics, but on a huge scale, because we're talking about thousands of pigs, right? And when you have close quarters, disease spreads easily, right? Which is why if you're done a factory farm, you need to do something like this. But the problem is that you breed these uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria really quickly in those types of conditions. So um, there's an article, it's kind of old, but if you're interested, there's a link to it. You can read it. Um, if that's sort of up your alley of things you're interested in. Um, so when you see things like no antibiotics labeled on your meat, like that's kind of what they're getting at. Like, hey, we're aware of this, we don't do that. So um, yeah, we're getting there. There's some regulations that are in place, but it's slow. It's slow to get to the point where we don't, uh, aren't causing that problem. So it's interesting, interesting stuff applicable to your own life. Okay. Very good.
Uh, let's talk more about superbugs, shall we? Have you guys ever heard of MRSA? MRSA? Yeah. It's pretty widely um, known these days. So if you're not familiar, MRSA stands for Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And Staph aureus is a ubiquitous bacterial species. It's everywhere. It's probably on your skin. Usually it doesn't cause problems, but there are certain strains that can, okay, that cause infections, skin infections, and then they, then they can cause larger problems, bloodstream infections, organ infections, um, and it can kill you if it gets really bad. So it is a significant problem because it's resistant to not just methicillin, but a lot of other antibiotics. Methicillin is one of the stronger ones. So if you get to the point where you can't kill something with methicillin, you've already tried a lot of the other stuff. Okay, so that's why this one is particularly significant. Um, mostly associated, at least originally, with healthcare facilities like hospitals. So hospitals and long-term care facilities are a really easy place to breed antibiotic uh, resistant bacteria because you're constantly sterilizing services, right? You're constantly washing your hands, which is good, but that's where all the sick people are. So if you take all the bugs and you concentrate them in one place and then you sanitize, the ones that don't respond to that sanitization can become problematic. Okay, so healthcare facilities tend to be sort of hot spots for this type of thing. This got really bad about 15 years ago or so when um, we started to see what they call community associated MRSA. So you would see people who were young, healthy, not in the hospitals who were popping up with these types of skin infections um, and ultimately bloodstream infections in some cases. So that's when it got really scary, like daycare centers and high school gyms and health clubs and stuff like that, okay? Um, the good news on MRSA is that the CDC was on it, okay? And the decrease in infections uh, with MRSA went down like dramatically from 2005 to like 2012 or so, and it's kind of holding steady now. So it used to be like a really big scary deal. It's still around and it's still a big scary deal, but it's less common because of education um, and just different practices in healthcare settings and of surveillance. So they know to look for. But it's just another example that many people have heard of. Um, it's really tough to get rid of if you get that type of infection. So that's just what MRSA is uh, on that subject. Other horrifying things that bacteria can do. How about foodborne illness? Oh, this is a fun discussion. What is foodborne illness? Yeah, salmonella is a great example. Basically, it's food poisoning. Anyone ever had that? I don't know, I said stuff was the worst, but food poisoning is pretty bad too. Um, basically, you can get food poisoning or foodborne illness or foodborne disease from any contaminated food. It doesn't have to be bacteria, it can be uh, other types of eukaryotic parasites or things like that as well. But bacteria are a big one, things like salmonella. Um, some statistics on here, according to CDC, 76 million people every year uh, get food poisoning, 300,000 or more are hospitalized, and 5,000 die each year from food poisoning. Crazy to think about. Um, often linked to produce contaminated, contaminated by animal waste. So why is produce particularly risky with foodborne illness, do you think? Things like spinach or salad greens, yeah. They don't cook it. So stuff that you eat raw, you're not killing any bacteria. Right, by cooking it. So usually most things, unless you're talking about thermophiles, right, extreme bacteria, or extreme heat tolerant bacteria, you're mostly killing stuff. That's why uh, there are food safe temperatures. If you're making some food in the oven on some like frozen chicken nuggets, right? So it'll tell you, cook this to 165 degrees. So you kill anything that's in it, right? Um, or if you go to a restaurant and then you order something that they cook to temperature, like they won't serve you a rare burger. Right? Because they're not going to be responsible for giving you salmonella. You're going to cook it to a certain temperature because you know that you're safe at that point for most people. But with raw produce, you don't have to do that. So um, the most recent sort of outbreaks of things that you guys have probably seen around, roaming lettuce. It was like, what, a year or two ago, we couldn't get romaine. We went to the grocery store because it was all contaminated with coma. Um, and spinach was one several years back. Sprouts. Things that you just don't cook, right, tend to be more more um, risky, and how do they get contaminated with animal waste? Well, it all comes down to farming, right? So it's very, very common to have vegetable farms and animal farms next to each other, and then you have runoff, and then you get water, or, or you're using um, water that is collected from animal farms to water your vegetables. So that can be an issue. 
Um, so cook your food, wash your food well, and be careful. Foodborne illness, illness is a real thing. All right, we've got three minutes. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff to talk about that's actually good. So I was going to say let's spend the last three minutes talking about good bacteria, but let's wait and do this on Monday next week. Um, we're almost done. There's only three slides left, and it's all benefits. So we'll end on a sad story about food poisoning, but we'll pick up on Monday talking about beneficial bacteria um, and things that they do for the ecosystem and for us specifically as humans. And then we'll get into um, our produce chapter, which I think is one of my favorite ones. And then we'll have uh, a class discussion. We'll read some stuff about produce. Way more interesting than you think, I promise. Anyway, that's what we'll do next. So the PowerPoint's up. Um, I'll probably go ahead and post some readings in the next couple of days, but don't worry about doing anything with them until I find it. So that's where we're headed. All right, thanks for your attention.